Today is July 14th, 2015. We are at the Ninth Circuit uh, Judicial Conference in San Diego, California. Um, we are here to interview uh, Judge Rosanna Peterson in a brief video oral history to record some reflections on her career in the law. My name is Brad Williams, and I'm here on behalf of the Ninth Judicial Circuit Historical Society. This interview will be preserved in the NJCHS archives, and the Historical Society will provide you, Your Honor, with a copy for your own use. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks for being with us here today. Uh, I understand that you were born in Salt Lake City. Right. Is that where you grew up? It is. Uh, I grew up in Salt Lake City. Both of my parents were from Utah, and so long tradition of being from Utah. And, uh, and you went to high school in Salt Lake City. I did, yes. And, and you even did a, a stint at the University of Utah. I did, that's correct. A couple of semesters, a couple of years at the University of Utah before I got married. And what were you studying? Oh, I was just getting my bachelor's degree, but I was majoring in political science because I thought that was a requirement in order to go to law school. Oh, so at that time, when you entered college, um, you already had an idea that you wanted to go to law school. Absolutely, yes. Were there lawyers in your family? None whatsoever. I had never met a lawyer. I guess I have a great uncle who's a lawyer, but I wouldn't be able to pick him out of a lineup. I see. If he's ever in one. I did, and probably would be. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, what decided you on that, on that career path? Well, I was very interested in it for several reasons. Um, one was basically I'd been in high school debate and I was born in 1951, so I was in high school graduating in 1969, which was the time of very interesting Supreme Court decisions. Miranda, uh, Escobedo, a variety of other uh, cases like that. And also, it, it kind of surprised me when you called me Judge Peterson, because I always use my maiden name also, so I'm, I'm usually referred to as Rosanna Maloof Peterson. Uh, half my background is Lebanese. My paternal grandparents were immigrants from Lebanon, and I was very aware of injustices that occurred and the, was sensitive to people growing uh, up in areas outside of the mainstream culture. Law seemed a good way to equalize the playing field. Well, that's very interesting. Um, when, did your, when did your grandparents come to this country? They came separately. My grandfather, I'm not sure whether he came before 1900. My grandmother, um, who did not know my grandfather at that time, came around 1906 during the time the Ottoman Turks were in Lebanon. I see. And they settled in Utah? Yes. Were they part of LDS? No. Uh, neither of my paternal grandparents were LDS. They were both uh, Maronite Christians. Uh, although my mother's family, which had long time roots in Utah, were LDS. I see. Um, so you go, you 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 spend a couple of years at the University of Utah, studying political science, um, and then um, I believe you got married. You said, right? It was during the Vietnam War. I met my husband as he was graduating from college, and I was graduating from high school. He served for Uncle Sam. And during that time period, I was at the University of Utah, and then uh, we married when he got out of the military. I see. Uh, and is that what took you to North Dakota? Uh, eventually. We actually went back. We were in California for a while because he had been at the Defense Language Institute. Oh, really? And then he went back to graduate school. We were both going to school for a while back in Utah, and then I put him through his PhD along with the GI Bill. Once he got his PhD, his first teaching position was in North Dakota. And when we went to North Dakota, then I finished my bachelor's degree and we began our family. And while my children were young, um, I was invited to teach at the University of North Dakota. So I taught 
in the English department and was asked to go on to graduate school there, so I got a master's in English. Oh, I see. What, what did you do your master's uh, thesis on? It was on um, dysfunctional utopias in British literature. Not exactly practical on a day-to-day -day basis. I fully understand that. I was, a, I was an English major as an undergraduate and then got a master's degree in American studies. Ah. You know, it's yeah. just nothing you can go out and put in the bank. <laughs> right. And actually, I thought my uh, switching to an English major was the end of my legal aspirations. I did not anticipate that I would be able to use an English degree to further any legal education. I had already thought that that was probably not a reasonable alternative for me. However, when my son became three, and my daughter was nine, and I had been teaching full-time at the University of North Dakota in the English department, uh, and they were urging me to get a PhD in English, which I did not want, I revisited the concept of law and went to law school. At the University of North Dakota. Right, because my husband was still a professor there. What was his field, or what is his field? His, he has a PhD in education, but he currently teaches leadership and Chinese and Western civilization. Oh, now that's an interesting combination. It is. Um, so when, you go, when do you go back to, uh, to uh, law school? Or when you go to law school? How old was I? Yes. Well, uh, not, you don't have to tell me your age, but, but oh, when, I, when did you go back to law school? When, Were you still, you're raising your kids. One thing about being an Article Three in the age of the Internet, there are no secrets about age. So I actually did not go back to law school until I was about 37. And that's when I started law school. I discovered my bachelor's and master's in English were very helpful in pursuing legal education. And so I began a full-time program. Um, as I mentioned, my daughter was nine and my son was three. During that time period, it was juggling the young children, juggling law school. And then after, during my second year of law school, my husband and I had decided that it would be a good idea to begin my legal career wherever we wanted to live permanently. He had already earned a full professorship, chair of the department, had um, pretty well maxed out his ambitions uh, at the academic level. So he applied for jobs and was offered several around the country and we opted for Spokane, Washington where he joined the faculty at Washington State University which meant I was actually still needing to finish my third year of law school. We decided I had, I decided mostly that I had the support group for the children. So I single parented, um, he was a long distance parent. I was editor in chief of the law review. I finished my third year of law school and uh, participated in moot court competitions and got the house ready to sell. Wow, that's ambitious. That is really ambitious. It was necessary. Um, were there professors um, at, at law school who were particularly influential for you? Uh, you know, University of North Dakota was a very good law school. I, I was fortunate. They were generous with scholarships. And then once I became editor-in-chief, I had a small stipend as well as uh, free tuition. There was one professor to whom I was particularly close, the Law Review editor. She has recently passed away, but Marcia O'Kelly. Um, and she was great. The dean of the law school, Jerry Davis, was great. I'm still in touch with him. And they were, everyone was supportive. Were there many other women uh, in the law school when you were there? As far as students, there were. There were it was about a 40% uh, women population for the law school body. And I'd say the faculty was about 40% women. Well, that's interesting. Uh, a big change from 20 years prior. Yes. Um, so um, 
was your intent in going to law school to uh, come out and start to practice? Uh, yes, I, I'm not sure I was quite that focused on exactly what I was going to do. Certainly I had already been a university professor and being a professor seemed like a desirable option. When I was in law school, I participated in externship programs and I had clerked for a local judge. Being a judge seemed like a desirable option. And um, I also had clerked for, uh, for a senator's office and that seemed not quite so desirable. But I was interested in a variety of areas, particularly constitutional law. And so the anticipation of maybe getting into criminal law, whether as a prosecutor or a defense attorney, uh, held a lot of attraction. I see. So the judge you were a uh, judicial extern for was uh, Judge Bowman? Yes, right. Wonderful gentleman, uh, still alive. I still have periodic contact with him. And, um, uh, and, and being a legal extern for Senator Conrad, is yes. that right? And, and that was political science in action, I suppose, wasn't it? It was. It was, an, it was interesting to see how uh, senators deal with constituents' problems. But were you an extern um, in North Dakota, or did you go back to Washington? No, I was in North Dakota. Uh -huh. That makes sense with the kids still there, right? Right. Um, well, tell me what happened um, when you were finished uh, uh, your, your uh, clerkship with, uh, with the senator. Well, that was, of course, just when I was still in law school. Mm -hmm. So right as I was beginning my third year of law school, I had also applied for judicial clerkships in Spokane, Washington, and only in Spokane, Washington, which is where my husband was. And I was very fortunate. Um, the judges were receptive, opened the doors for me, and um, Judge Fred Van Sickle was in the confirmation process. And Judge Quackenbush, then chief judge, was interviewing potential law clerks for Judge Van Sickle. And um, so as a third year law student, I interviewed with Judge Quackenbush and then Judge McDonald together, who were screening candidates both for Judge Van Sickle and for Judge Nielsen, who was also waiting confirmation. Uh, apparently, I've heard after the fact that Judge Quackenbush and Judge McDonald told Je Judge Van Sickle, you need to hire her. Uh, as it turned out, they had just suggested to me I not take another job until I talked to them. I didn't really have time to look for any other jobs, but I finished my third year of law school and Judge Quackenbush, always vigilant, called me the day of graduation and said, I have an interview set up for you with Judge Van Sickle. When can you be out here? Interesting. So did you ever take the bar in North, North Dakota? I did not. Uh, I, I had some very good connections uh, because of my law review work in North Dakota and I had some offers of clerkships there, but I never took the bar or practiced in North Dakota. I began my clerkship with Judge Van Sickle and studied for the Washington bar in the evenings. So um, it was begin the clerkship, study in the evenings, and then take a week off to take the bar exam. And fortunately, I passed. I was not entirely confident I was going to. Um, and, and raise kids at the same time. Right. I mean, this, is, this is an amazing juggling act. Um, so I take it you did not take a bar review course in Spokane. I did. Oh, you did. Uh, in the evenings, mm -hmm. there was a video, then video. Uh, everyone had to show up at the law school and watch the same video. Mm -hmm. And it was a book. Mm -hmm. So you pass, uh, and you're still, at this time, you're still uh, clerking for Judge Van Sickle? Right. That was 91 through 93, to your clerkship. And then I went to a private law firm in Spokane, and uh, almost immediately, in fact, as I recall, I had been 
uh, out of the clerkship five days when I was called by a federal judge to come represent a minor witness in a criminal trial in federal court. And so this was uh, pro bono? Oh, no, it was through the CJA Act, oh, I but see. I was not on the panel yet because I did not have practice experience, although I had my two-year clerkship. I see. Um, and, and how did that go? Uh, it was a little rough. <laughs> uh, interestingly, Judy Clark was the defense attorney for the main defendant. And that was my first interaction with Judy Clark, who became a mentor to me, and as you know, who uh, had developed a friendship with over the years. But uh, at the law firm, there was not really a criminal defense practice developed, but one of the senior partners joined the CJA panel so that I could work the cases, so that I could be in court. I also um, I accepted civil cases, and the firm had a contract uh, with the YWCA for somewhat prosecuting domestic violence cases. So I gained experience that way, too. Oh, well, that's interesting. Um, had you thought you were going to be doing um, criminal work? I had anticipated that criminal work is fascinating, whether as a prosecutor or as a defense attorney. It goes to the heart of the Constitution, and I've always been attracted by constitutional law. There had been a point where I had applied to the U.S. Attorney's Office, this is later in the story, and I was offered a position not in Spokane, and I opted not to pursue that because my children were still in school and my husband was in Spokane. Right. Um, what other kinds of cases did you handle in private practice? Well, after I left that firm, um, and then I joined another firm eventually before I created a partnership with another attorney. I handled a variety of cases, but uh, specialized with a second law firm with education uh, cases. We would represent teachers. We were hired by the uh, State Education Association. Uh, so there were a lot of interesting educational cases, both students and mostly teachers who were in some sort of disciplinary action. Uh, we handled a lot of employment cases, plaintiff work generally, so employment discrimination. Then later on my own, I did, I accepted a lot of commercial litigation type cases. Um, so I just had developed enough of a client base that they would bring me, the clients would bring me a variety of cases. So it sounds like a lot of your work was in state court. I, except I always maintained a CJA panel membership. Mm -hmm. So I always was representing indigent defendants in federal court. And some of my civil cases were in federal court as well. When did you begin to think that uh, you might like to be a judge? Oh, I think that was about my second year of law school when I clerked for Judge Bowman. I thought, no, oh, this looks pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. um, any, other, any other significant cases stand out in your mind from your private practice? There are a variety of cases uh, that have all left their mark on me. and. Um, Probably the criminal cases are the ones that have left the biggest mark, the biggest impact, uh, partially from a defense viewpoint because of the ripple effect of how much it affects victims, but also the defendant's family and friends. Mm -hmm. So tell us about um, how your nomination to the, the federal bench came about. Well, I had... Um, while I had been practicing, I also had been asked to begin teaching at Gonzaga Law School. And so I began teaching trial advocacy, and then the faculty asked me to teach evidence. Eventually, I had shifted more of my work into teaching and just maintained 
CJA panel membership uh, representing indigent defendants and um, mostly was teaching and also directing the externship program. There had not been in our district a woman appointed as an Article III judge. We had only had two women who had ever served on the bench. One as a magistrate judge, Cynthia Ambronio, and one as a bankruptcy judge, Patricia Williams. But there had never been a woman as an Article III judge. There had not been a new judge appointed in 15 years. And when Judge Van Sickle, the judge who I actually clerked for, arranged his senior status and that process was begun, I was encouraged by a variety of people to apply for the position. So I was in a very good position to do so because I was at the law school. I did not have to turn away clients or um, somehow figure out conflicts, but I could put in my application, which I did do so in the fall of 2008. And, and how did that process go for you? I was very fortunate, obviously. I'm sitting here as the chief judge right now. <laughs> But uh, in Washington, the senators use a bipartisan merit selection committee. Mm -hmm. So there was a process of uh, this bipartisan merit selection committee reviewing the candidates, then interviewing and recommending three names to the senators. Then in spring of 2009, the three finalists were interviewed by the senators and in about June of that year, I was notified that I was the presumptive candidate and needed to fill out all of my FBI background paperwork, which I did. Uh, and then in fall of 2009, I flew back to meet with White House counsel and with the Department of Justice nominating committee members, interviewed with them, uh, I was nominated by the president, by President Barack Obama, in October of 2009. My confirmation hearing was November 18th of 2009, and I was confirmed January 25th of 2010. Very speedy. By comparison to the rest of, of President Obama's uh, nominees in recent years of this administration, yes. Who uh, was Patty Murray senator? At senator the time? Murray and Senator Cantwell. Uh huh. And did either speak on your behalf at the confirmation hearing? Both of them did. Both of them appeared and presented lovely remarks. That's that's helpful. Yes, yes, it is. Um, so, do you remember? Um, do you remember your first day on on the bench as a federal judge? I do. Um, because there had not been any new judges for a number of years, and several, several of the judges had by then taken senior status, and Judge Van Sickle had taken senior status by then about two years previously, although he was still carrying his caseload, uh, judges were eager to reduce their caseload. Um, so I received 110 civil cases my first day and was put on the criminal docket wheel. And so I remember just coming to grips with where everything was, what was, you know, what were the pending motions, when was trial set, which ones I would need to move, which ones I didn't need to move. Was Judge Whaley on the court at that he, time? He was. He was. Um, I think he had not yet taken senior status at that point. He is still on the court, although he's going to be leaving soon. Mm -hmm. um, any cases from, well, let me ask you, um, uh, is there anything that I haven't asked you uh, today that you'd like to tell us about? Well, I, I certainly think it's important to have a lot of diversity on the bench. We have recently, in our district, gone through quite a change. After one year on the bench, I became chief judge because of the statute that uh, governs that. 
during my now four and a half years as chief judge, we have had a complete generational turnover. We have uh, three new active judges who are all junior to me. We've had a new clerk of court, a new chief probation officer, and two new magistrate judges. And all of that has been not because of people being driven out, but because of retirement. They had all served approximately 28 years. So our court went from my being the, um, I must have been the seventh, the first new active judge, but um, anyway, we've now switched. So we have six senior judges and four active judges. We had, um, I think three senior judges or four senior judges and three active judges when I joined. And so it's a very different dynamic. We now have our first judge of color and uh, that has been a, a big plus. We've lost the other two women on the bench. I think it's important for anybody viewing this and in the future to understand that there are opportunities to be had whether or not you have any lawyers in your family, whether you come from a tradition where women generally don't have the opportunity to succeed at the highest level that really there are no limitations. Well, Your Honor, I'm delighted that you made time to sit down and chat with us today and um, I really do appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you for asking me.